So I'm here with Dr. Amar Krishnaswamy, who is one of the principal physicians who works within our structural heart disease program. Uh, you know, as you all know, structural heart disease has evolved in recent years to be a lot of different things. And we've talked a, a lot about uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, but you're doing a lot of other things now. So let's talk about a few of them. Uh, uh, right now, uh, the mitral clip is pretty hot. So uh, I presume you're doing a lot of these procedures? We're doing a lot of mitral clips, and yeah. the exciting thing about the mitral clip is that it's a procedure we've done here at Cleveland Clinic for over a decade now. Yeah. Uh, we started out uh, doing them actually in all groups of patients in both of the areas of mitral valve regurgitation, degenerative mitral regurgitation and functional mitral regurgitation. Yes. And then for a while, <clears throat> we did them almost exclusively in patients with degenerative disease yeah. because that's where the FDA approval was. Yes. And the most exciting news about the mitral clip over the last about eight months or so is that there was a landmark trial that was published in September of 2018, specifically looking at patients with functional mitral valve regurgitation. And it demonstrated a substantial reduction, not only in things like heart failure, hospitalization, uh, and quality of life for patients were improved, but it demonstrated a substantial improvement in survival for us to fix functional mitral regurgitation with a mitral clip. Now, by functional regurgitation, you're talking about people who have enlarged ventricles with central jets, generally enlarged due to heart failure? Exactly right. So that's, the heart is enlarged whether due to long-standing coronary artery disease or for some people, enlargement of the heart and heart dysfunction for reasons that are not at all clear. Cardiomyopathy. But nevertheless, the end product is always the same. The heart muscle is weak, the heart chamber is enlarged, and it pulls apart the mitral valve so it no longer comes together in the middle. So by placing a clip and restoring that, what we call coaptation, it allows some of the backflow of blood to instead go the right way. People feel a lot better with regard to shortness of breath. And who are the best candidates for a mitral clip? So. Um, to continue along the functional mitral regurgitation pathway, most patients there are going to be better suited to a mitral clip than to surgery. A lot of that is because historically, surgery has not worked well for these patients with functional mitral regurgitation. Usually their hearts are weaker, so the risks of surgery are higher. The recurrence of severe mitral regurgitation even after surgery is higher. So in those patients with what we call FMR, functional mitral regurgitation, mitral clip is usually going to be the best way to go. On the other hand, for patients with degenerative mitral regurgitation, or DMR, surgery is always demonstrated as a gold standard. We're very fortunate in the mitral surgeons that we have here at Cleveland Clinic. They do a lot of mitral surgery, both open and robotic. And generally speaking, the results are excellent and the procedure is safe. These are mostly repairs. These are mostly repairs. In fact, 95% of our patients here at Cleveland Clinic undergoing mitral valve surgery have a repair, yeah. which is not the case nationally, as you know. Yeah. On the other hand, for patients who might not be great surgical candidates, maybe they're a little bit older, maybe they have other medical conditions lung that disease. make surgery tough. Exactly. Lung disease is an important one. Uh, liver disease is another important factor that makes surgery difficult. Those patients, I think, are often very well suited to a mitral clip. Let's maybe turn from the mitral clip for a minute. Um, but structural heart disease interventions are really a broad range of things. So uh, uh, I know you guys sometimes repair uh, uh, perivalvular leaks. So can you maybe tell us about what's, what's happening in that area? Sure. That's a, it's a really exciting uh, area to be in is a repair of these paravalvular leaks, uh, which essentially is the result of uh, often uh, a suture that has come off of a surgical valve. And so there's a space between the cardiac tissue and the surgical valve itself. Um, there aren't a lot of places that do these procedures. And <clears throat> since it's a niche we've developed, uh, we tend to see a large number of these referrals. Um, often at other places, these patients have to go for a reoperation, an entire cardiac surgery. But what we can do is with catheters that are placed uh, in the femoral vein at the leg and the patient's still fully awake like any routine catheterization, uh, we go up to where that valve leaks around the uh, 
between the heart tissue and the valve, and we put little plugs. These plugs are not exactly designed for that application. What are they designed for? Uh, there's a lot of different reasons. They're often used uh, for abnormal blood vessels that need to be closed off. Okay. So that's why these devices are called vascular plugs. Yeah. Uh, so often these are used by our colleagues in interventional radiology. Yes. Uh, so we're able to apply those devices to these paravalvular leaks and it's basically like stuffing cotton balls into the top of a medicine jar and it closes the leak. So patients feel better, they've avoided a reoperation, uh, so everyone's happy. Success rate's pretty high? Uh, thankfully, again, because these are procedures uh, in which we spend a lot of time, not only in the procedure, but beforehand to really analyze the anatomy and the imaging, uh, we have a, a rate of successful closure of more than 95%. Yeah. But you know, what you're also emphasizing here in the sole structural heart disease realm is the importance of having a team. Imaging people, Absolutely. everybody kind of comes together and picks the patients that are gonna most benefit and then really addresses them. Now, uh, a controversial area, I've watched this controversy over decades, is PFO closure. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we could talk a little bit about circa 2019. Sure. Who should get their PFO closed and who shouldn't? Sure. I think it has been a very controversial topic for very good reason, because 30 to 40 percent of people walking around have a PFO. I think the reason that the controversy is starting to abate a little bit in the recent past is we have really three clinical trials that were the best done PFO trials, uh, frankly, ever, and were published about a year and a half ago. And all three of them demonstrated very consistent results, which is looking at uh, whether you ha a patient who had a stroke and a PFO if closing the PFO would help. And what we found is that there was substantial risk reduction in recurrent stroke in those patients who had the PFO closed. But the reason these trials were, were so good and why they were a departure from the controversial results previously is that they only took patients who had a documented stroke, so they did not look at stroke and TIA, which is a hard definition. They only looked at stroke. <clears throat> they also had very thorough evaluations to make sure there was not another cause of for that patient to have a stroke, whether atrial fibrillation right. or other vascular disease risk factors. So cryptogenic stroke. Crypt, truly cryptogenic. Yeah. Although we now don't like to say cryptogenic, we say PFO related because yeah. we have a reason. <laughs> so uh, overall, I think, again, as you suggested earlier, making sure that we're really taking the patient from a 30,000 foot view, analyzing them holistically, making sure we've looked at any possible factors why they could have had a stroke. And if all we come back to is the PFO, that doesn't still mean we're always closing the PFO. We then take a look at the anatomy of the PFO, yeah. various factors to say, this is just a bystander PFO or this is a high risk PFO. And so in that group of patients with a high risk PFO and no other reason, I think we really help them. And the studies would suggest reducing by more than 90% the risk of a recurrent stroke. That's really very impressive. Now, uh, everybody knows about transcatheter aortic valve replacement, but you're starting to tackle other valves with valve replacement. Where do we stand? So it, it's, as you suggest, it's an exciting time for structural cardiac intervention, in large part with the precedence set by transcatheter AVR or TAVR. And our successes in TAVR actually have allowed us to move to the other valves because I think it gives people confidence that what we can do with catheters is really at least as good, if not in some ways better, than what was traditionally happening surgically. So the moves that we've made initially were to the mitral valve with things like the mitral clip, as we've already discussed. Although now what we're finding is that in patients who have had a mitral valve replacement or a mitral valve ring repair, when that fails, rather than that patient going through another open heart surgery, we're able to simply place a TAVR, a transcatheter aortic valve prosthetic, into that mitral position as well. Is that an on-label or an off-label use? It is FDA approved. Okay. So you're using an aortic prosthesis in the mitral position. Exactly. Is it big enough? Uh, it often is, although some patients, uh, especially with larger hearts, just may have had a ring or a valve into the mitral position that's larger than what we can treat. That's a pretty rare phenomenon. 
But the difference is that similar to the TAVR, this is a procedure that we do while the patient is awake. Yeah. It takes us about 45 minutes, uh, and then they have a new mitral valve. Yeah. And then uh, what about the tricuspid and pulmonic valve? Are you doing interventions on those? We are, and the tricuspid valve is a really exciting area for us because it was often described as the forgotten valve. People yes. didn't pay attention. But what we're finding is that you know, it does, the tricuspid valve may not affect lifespan or survival, and perhaps that's why people don't pay attention to it, but from a patient level, it can be really troubling. These people have liver congestion and they have edema, and they don't feel very good. They don't, absolutely, and they often will have the exact same functional incapacities that people have with the other valves. So it's, people with tricuspid disease, actually, when we fix it, are among the most thankful because they've been told by so many people either don't worry about it or there's nothing to do about it. So it's, in that regard, really satisfying. And what do you do? So there are a few different options. Um, often if people have mitral valve disease for whom we're doing a mitra clip and they have tricuspid valve disease, after we clip the mitral, we'll also put the clips on the tricuspid. Obviously it's an off-label indication, but and we discuss that with the patients beforehand, but frankly, they feel so good, no one complains about yeah. that fact. Um, we do uh, a lot of research, uh, myself, my colleague Samir Kapadia, uh, and our colleague in cardiac surgery, Jose Navia, who developed a valve specifically uh, for the tricuspid. It's called the Navigate Valve, uh, and what we do is implant that valve through the neck vein or, the, uh, or actually opening the side of the chest and replace the tricuspid valve with this. This is still in trial, of course. Yeah, very interesting. Well, uh, this has been fascinating. Uh, uh, there is really a wide range of interventions. We did this discussion. We never even talked about uh, uh, TAVR. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of things that you're doing now, and uh, obviously the, it's a great uh, era for patients uh, to avoid uh, some of the more surgical approaches and you have a less invasive these folks go home what a day or two or, or even you know next day next day and, yeah, most often and so uh, it's a tremendous advance and we appreciate your bringing us up to speed on all this and thank, thank you, you very much thank My you pleasure. for thank you for watching